Today's podcast is sponsored by The Morning Navigator, a daily newsletter written by Tony Greer, who is a 30-year veteran trader in the financial markets. I think it's important to be responsible with your personal finances and investments, and it's hard to do that without understanding the markets. Now this is where The Morning Navigator fills a specific need for me. If you're looking for actionable trade ideas or simply to educate yourself about the markets, then The Morning Navigator will help you to do both. It's an interesting, informative, and amusing daily read. Now, a subscription to The Morning Navigator normally costs $60 a month or $650 per year. However, my listeners can go to tgmacro.com, sign up for a free one-week trial, and apply the code ZUBY, Z-U-B-Y, at checkout for a discount of either $10 off the $60 a month subscription or $100 off the $650 annual subscription. As you can infer, the annual subscription is a better deal. Either one is a win when it comes to understanding the global markets and managing your personal investments. So once again, you can sign up today for a free trial at tgmacro.com. tgmacro.com. Go check it out. What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. Now, on today's episode, we have got on the coolest headmistress in the UK. She is a personal friend of mine. She is the founder and the headmistress at Michaela Community School in London. And of course, this is the wonderful Miss Catherine Verbal Singh. How are you doing? Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> awesome. So I've just done a really brief intro there, but for people who are not familiar with you, can you uh, give yourself a little introduction? Sure. Well, we're relatively controversial as a school because we're very traditional. Uh, we believe in high standards of discipline uh, and behavior. We believe that knowledge should be central to the classroom so the teacher is leading the learning um, as opposed to the children leading the learning uh, and that the adult is very much an authority in the classroom. Uh, and I suppose I believe in small c conservative values and that can make me a bit controversial and I tweet things sometimes on Twitter that get me into trouble. Um, but, you know, we've been open since 2014. Uh, the children are doing really well. We're in the inner city. To give your listeners an, a bit of an understanding, you know, it's not uncommon for kids to turn up, boys to turn up on bikes outside carrying knives with masks on, waiting for some of our boys. Uh, one of our boys last year came out of his GCSE exams, which are the national exams they take at 16 here, um, went outside and got stabbed with a compass, a couple of compasses. Um, by a couple, some boys from another school. So, you know, this is the inner city mm. and we, all the troubles with, you know, gang crime, knife crime, uh, that, that, that sort of thing happens for us. So, um, but the fact is that uh, the kids are doing really well here. Um, you know, we, we got some of the top results in the country last year in terms of, you know, our GCSE results. Um, and, um, and I would say a lot of that has to do with uh, the kind of values that we promote within the school. Also, whenever visitors, we get visitors from around the world. So from the US, also from across the country, we get people from Australia, from Germany, all over the place. And they come here. And what the teachers who visit say all the time is that they're so amazed by how polite the children are, how respectful, how articulate, how resilient, how driven and so on. And um, these are kids from very poor backgrounds who wouldn't normally... Uh, you know, not much would be expected of them. And uh, they're aiming for the very top. And um, I think that is because of the values that we promote within the school. Okay. So firstly, I want to say congratulations on those results. I saw several articles in the mainstream media last year, uh, yeah, which were, you. you know, giving the accolades, which, which they had to really, because the results speak for themselves. So given the results speak for themselves, given the students are doing so well and outperforming their peers who are coming from especially similar socioeconomic backgrounds and certain areas. Yes. Why is, why is the school and why are you deemed controversial in your own words? Um, yeah. So I say things. So <coughs> I think that too often in education, excuses are made in particular for children who come from poorer backgrounds. Um, if you live on a council estate, uh, if you uh, are black, if you have a single mother, if you live in the inner city, uh, that sort of thing, uh, sometimes teachers can feel uncomfortable about holding you to the same standards as somebody else. Um, I was, uh, oh, I was just being interviewed uh, earlier on today 
uh, by a journalist here and um, uh, for one of the newspapers in Britain. And she was saying to me how uh, kissing teeth um, is something that many black people are annoyed that children will be reprimanded for this because it's just part of their culture. Ooh. And um, <laughs> what is the, ju- saying, the journalist said that? Yeah, she oh, said, good, "What do you good. think about that? Black okay. boys or girls are being uh, targeted in schools mm. because when it's part of your behavior policy that you're not allowed to kiss teeth, that means they're not allowed to express themselves in their culture." And she was saying this to me, saying, "Well, look, you know, you have this in your behavior policy. Let black children be black. Let them kiss their teeth." And I was saying. This is ridiculous. Every mm. black person knows that kissing your teeth is rude. Of I mean, I, I've never heard any such thing. <laughs> and if it's rude, then obviously we don't let the kids do it. I don't care what color you are. No yeah. child is allowed to kiss their teeth and they kiss their teeth and they get into trouble. And if I say, oh no, no, but you're black. So it's part of your culture. Mm. Yeah. And he knows it's rude. That's why he's doing it. Cause it's yeah. rude. I mean, it, it's so absurd. And, and um, she was saying other things to me like, well, you know, Black children, it's difficult, you know, why? She was more or less saying we shouldn't hold them to the same standards mm-hmm. as the other children. And I was saying, I don't understand this, this thinking, which is that because he's black, he can't possibly behave as well as the white kid. And that they think that this is being progressive. Mm-hmm. They think that this, and that I am being reactionary and controversial in saying that all children should be able to behave themselves, whatever color they are. Um, what? What often I find the progressives don't understand is that, or what they think is that children do not have agency. Mm. They think that the child is not choosing to kiss his teeth. They think he can't help it because it's just part of his culture. Yeah. And I'm saying, no, he knows very well that it's being rude and that's why he's doing it. Um, and if you teach him that it's rude and that he shouldn't do it and that you give him a, a punishment for doing it, next time he won't do it, you know? Mm-hmm. And... Um, I think too often children uh, from uh, different sorts of backgrounds, it could be that they're poor and white, it could be that they're poor and black, it could be they live in the inner city, whatever it is, uh, they're often let down by well-meaning liberals, is what I would call them, uh, people who are left-leaning, who um, find it uncomfortable to hold the line on what I call small C conservative values, yeah. believing that children, uh, that children are children, the adult is the adult, that we are in the position of authority. Uh, too often, I think people conflate authority with authoritarianism, mm-hmm. and they think that if you're in authority, you must be Hitler, and that's ridiculous. Um, as, a, as, as, a, as an adult, it's our role and our duty uh, to lead children forward. And you do that with love, right? It's because you love them that you hold them to account and that you follow through. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 101 class and being a teacher is mean what you say, say what you mean. Um, And if you say to them, you're going to get a detention if you do X, then you follow through with that detention. And then the Mm -hmm. child quickly learns, oh, you know what? Next time I'm not going to do that. Um, It should be relatively simple. But I find that in 2020, uh, many people are questioning the basic... um, the basic norms that used to be basic norms 50 years ago, all parents, all teachers knew this, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Nowadays, uh, it's all about letting the child be who he wants to be and find himself and uh, just be happy. And they don't seem to understand that happiness is a complex thing and it Mm -hmm. comes from uh, the child being surrounded by love and order and structure. And by that, it means that the, teacher or the parent has to hold them to account and sometimes punish them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <coughs> don't, do you find it weird that that is now considered specifically, I mean, you use the term small C conservative. I mean, that sounds to me almost like common sense, right? This, these are yeah. things that people have known for centuries, if, if not millennia. So yes. why is it that it seems fairly recently, maybe in the past decade or so, we've yeah. sort of reached this place where holding people to the same standard and treating them equally, regardless of where they're from or their skin color or whatever, how has that become a, inverted commas, conservative 
principle. I mean, isn't that what liberalism so was supposed to be based on? I know. I mean, I always put it down to guilt, white guilt. So they feel uncomfortable. They feel, you know, when that woman was talking to me about, she doesn't realize that kissing teeth is rude. You know, she's not part of her culture. Mm. Uh, I know it because my black Jamaican mother would have whacked me around the head <laughs> if I <laughs> dared to kiss my teeth in front of her, yeah. you know? And so, you know, I, I, I get that, um, I get that if you're white, you don't really know. And if some black people are telling you, oh, you don't get it, I'm black and you're not, and this mm. is my culture, then they feel awkward and don't really know what to do about it. Mm. Yeah? And yeah. they feel guilty about their own privilege. Mm. So um, they don't want to put the child in detention for not doing his homework because they think, well, I don't know what it's like not to have a desk at home. I don't know what it's like to have four brother, five brothers and sisters at home and, and maybe mom isn't there to support in the right kind of way. And it, maybe it's just a bit mean to expect the same of this child as it is of the white middle class child who comes from a privileged background. And um, what I always say is, I'll tell you what's mean. Allowing children to leave school, not being able to read, write, and do basic numeracy. 20% of our children in Britain leave mm. school functionally illiterate and functionally enumerate, you know? Wow. And that is because of the low expectations that exist mm -hmm. uh, within schools. I mean, look, uh, you know, teachers might get annoyed when I say that and say, oh, but it's not all our fault. And I agree, of course, it's not all the fault of the school system. Uh, families have a big role to play in the upbringing of children and too Contro often they controversial fail. Controversial too, controversial yes. too. Yeah. Yes, yes, no, indeed. Too often they fail them. Um, they don't expect enough of their children. Uh, they don't support them enough at home. Uh, I also think families don't have enough information, especially when they're much younger. I think zero to five, for instance, uh, when the child is, is, before he gets to school, there's so much you can be doing with the child. And um, I mean, I was sitting on the, the tube the other, yesterday and I saw this woman with her cute little boy, he was about three or four, and he was just sat there. And she was sat there. We were on the tube for about half an hour together. And neither person, neither mom or boy spoke the entire time. Mm -hmm. And he didn't have a book and he didn't have anything. He was just sat there. And I was kind of waving at him and I was you know, <laughs> making faces and things and um and he would wave back but I was just thinking that you know this is half an hour he mm. could have been reading a book she could have been reading with him sometimes I sit on the tube and I see some mums they're there with their little toddler they're reading they're moving their finger under the words as they speak they're 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 using books that have rhymes they are singing the words and showing their enthusiasm for it and of course when they do that the child knows that their mum loves reading mm -hmm. and this is a bonding time that they can use with their child mm -hmm. um but if you don't know if you weren't brought up with books in that kind of way and if your friends and your aunts and uncles and so on everybody around you nobody actually values reading in that way you won't do it and what's mm -hmm. worse is that in this day and age with smartphones what i often see uh is in in the tube or in the bus or whatever i see uh, parents, they just give their phone to the child. Yeah. And the phone is used as a kind of babysitting device. And what they don't understand is they really are destroying every possibility for their child in doing that because the child understands bing, 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 bing. Mm. The, the, a book with its flat page of black and white cannot compete with what a smartphone does. And if the brain gets used to that kind of stimulation that comes from a smartphone, when you then try and get them to read later, they're not going to like reading. Yeah. And then what's sad is that parents just say things like, oh, well, he never liked reading. Oh, he was never good at maths. When actually, had he just been brought up differently, he would have been great at reading. Yeah. Um, it's funny. When you told me that story, I was actually thinking I'm quite impressed that the three-year-old managed to sit there for 30 minutes not doing anything. Uh, yes. In, in its own sure. way. That's <laughs> in its own yeah. way, I was thinking, well, that's probably better than them just gaming on an iPad or having some other that is dopamine yeah. hit coming in. So Yeah, you're right, you're right. Yeah, it is yeah. bad. She, the, the, so th that, that wasn't great. I would have rather she was talking to him. I would have yeah. rather she was reading to him or he was reading himself. Um, uh, that's right. But what's even worse are the children mm. who are there with the smartphone. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So how have you seen this whole thing? So how long have you been in the world of teaching and academia? Oh, my whole life. So okay. you know, um, I'm in my mid forties and um, I've been doing it since I left university and I'm obsessed with it. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I'm controversial. Mm. It's because over the years I've just watched 
I've learned through watching in my own classroom, in my own schools, what isn't going right. Mm -hmm. And too often the narrative in education is that, um, oh, it's that we don't have enough money. Oh, it's because we don't have the right building. You know, we don't have any money here. We have a terrible building, let me tell you. I mean, mm -hmm. there, nobody ever comments on our building. People who hate us don't say, well, they've got a great <laughs> building because they can't say it. You know, we've got yeah, the yeah. worst possible building. But the fact is that you make do with what you've got, you mm -hmm. know. And I think there's too much of the politics of envy that goes on in education. So what I mean by that is uh, we look at the private schools. We say, well, look, they've got, uh, look, look at all their grounds. Look at their wonderful um, sport offer. <coughs> and it's not fair. We can't offer that to our kids. And it's true. I mean, it isn't fair in the sense that um, my kids are, we don't have a sports hall. Mm -hmm. We don't even have any grass. We only have an old car park, which is really quite small for the kids to play in. We're right next to the train tracks. Um, and it, they make so much noise, the trains. I mean, it's very difficult. Uh, there's all sorts of things that aren't ideal about our situation. Um, but if I spent my whole time just pointing at the private schools and saying, it's not fair, it's not fair, then, well, I'd never do anything. And Absolutely. I think that there's too much of that that goes on. Uh, life is not fair. And the only way that you're going to make something of your life is to buckle down and work hard and whatever opportunities come your way, you go out and get those and then you make some more opportunities because that is the only way you'll survive. Otherwise, what happens is you get to age 85, you look back and you say, oh, well, you know, I couldn't make it. I was black. You know, I, I, I had to have a bad life because I, I was poor. You know, if my dad had been around, I would have had a good life. Well, you, you, you only have one life. You've only got one shot, right? And um, when I say that, I find too many uh, middle-class, well-off people who want me to be angry and upset mm -hmm. and, 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 and campaigning against the, the evil, privileged white guy yep. who is oppressing us. And the thing is, you know what? I'm not sure my children are poor because of some rich white guy. I mean, I, I don't know. You know, they're just poor. That's the way that it is. Yeah. And, um, and I think... I think and, all and, of it, this and if, it, if it's if it's white guys behind this, then the fact that you know it's the majority of poor kids in Britain are white kids. They're they're not doing their uh, job of oppression very well. Yes, although it's very <laughs> interesting the way in yeah. which <coughs> I mean, I work in a school which is you know there are very few white children because yeah. it's in the inner city. Sure, uh, you are right that in uh, say in the north of England, there's a lot more. Uh, you know, the, the, the poor are white there. Yeah, but um. I do find that actually the white working class are spoken about here in the way that say black communities in, in America are spoken about. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that, it's like the other, they are just this weird group of people we cannot understand. Um, and why is it that white children, white working class children are failing in Britain? Well, for the same reasons that black kids are failing in the U S yep. it's all the same, it's which is same. that, the behavior is poor in their, in their classrooms. Mm -hmm. their, their families aren't necessarily taking responsibility. Uh, the values that they are surrounded by are all the wrong values. So rather than having, so when I say that, what do I mean by small C conservative values? Personal responsibility, taking personal responsibility. You haven't brought your homework in? That's your problem. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hear about you left, the, the bus was late or your sister took it or the dog ate it or whatever it is. No, it's your responsibility. You don't have your pen today, right? Are you going to get a detention? Now that, for instance, seriously controversial in education. Give a detention for not having their pen? But what if they just forgot it? Yeah, that's what happened. They <laughs> forgot it. That, that's why they get the detention. And then you know what happens tomorrow? They don't forget it. Yeah. And then they never forget it. And then they become the kind of person, you see, they have to understand. What progressives don't understand is culture and habit. They mm -hmm. don't understand these two concepts. So. They think in the moment to be compassionate, you just forgive, forgive him for forgetting the pen, forgive him for kissing his tea. He was just annoyed in the moment. Let's forgive him. Mm -hmm. Now, what they don't understand is that if you don't uh, discipline the child on that point, it will become habitual and they will kiss their teeth all the time or they will forget their pen all the time. And then when they leave school and they're functionally illiterate or functionally enumerate and they can't get a job or they fail the GCSEs or whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, what happens is uh, the, the teachers say, well, he was poor. 
Oh, of of course. course, this was going to happen to him. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying, look, poverty is an obstacle. There's no question that clearly he would have been better off had he, you know, been born with riches. But of that's a, that, that's that's just the way that it is. He's poor. So right now that he's poor, what do we do about it? Right. Mm-hmm. Well, we need to make it so that we can get in the right kinds of habits in life, so that when he turns 16, 18. It, it's natural for him to bring a pen along. So when he goes for that interview at that job that he really wants, it, we've taught him how to sit on a chair and sit up straight. Mm-hmm. We've taught him how to make sure he has a pen with him just in case. We taught him how to shake hands, look at the person in the eye. So that all has become so natural and habitual for him because he's been doing it for years. And that has been habituated through giving a detention when he didn't do it right and so on. That when he turns up for that interview, his working memory doesn't have to hold all that stuff in his head. He can be thinking about the stuff he needs to know for the job, the yeah. content, the knowledge he needs. So he can impress them and say, well, you know, I know all about X, Y, and Z, but they're going to ask him about it. If he doesn't know that, then his working memory when going in there is, okay, I got to remember to shake his hand. I got to remember to look at him in the eye. I got to remember to sit down straight. All of that stuff he can't do. And then he fails the interview. So we have failed the child if we have not made those habits part of who he is by the time he leaves us Mm. and that those habits are created by a culture that surrounds the child so um people often come here and they say how come your children are so resilient you must give them lessons in resilience or they say how come your children are so polite how come they're so happy you must do happiness lessons and i say (laughs) no no it's all wrong because they think in this way of here's the problem had you had a general culture of expectation. So because our expectations are so high, our children are ambitious. Because our expectations are, no, 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 it was your personal responsibility. You didn't bring the homework in. You got the detention. They become more and more resilient because mm-hmm. then they get better at doing it. And the next time they get a detention, they go, oh, you know, it's a detention. I'll go and sit it. In fact, we even have children who thank their teachers for having been given a detention. I promise you. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, People always say, oh, that's crazy. That doesn't happen. Like, hey, you know, it does happen. And we do these uh, verbal appreciations. It's out loud at, um, at lunchtime where in front of 180 kids, the kids have to stand up and give an appreciation. And we do about five or six of these at the end of every lunch. It okay. allows them to do public speaking. And they get up and they say things like, I want to thank Mr. So-and-so for giving me a detention because I did X, Y, and Z and I shouldn't have done it. And now I'm going to learn my lesson. Right. Mm. And they do. I haven't told them to say this. Right. They do it because they get it. Our kids get it. And if you come here, they'll take you around, they'll take you on a tour and they'll say, look, it's really strict. And at first it took me a few weeks to get used to it and it was hard, but I'm so pleased I'm here because it keeps me on the straight now. And it's going to mean that I'm going to be able to make something of my life. And I just wish, you know, I just wish I went to visit primary school yesterday and uh, it's a friend of mine who runs this primary school and she loves everything. And her school, because she just started at this new school as, as the head teacher there. Mm-hmm. And she implemented all of the stuff that we've got here, right? All of the rules around discipline and everything. And we went, I went and I gave assembly and all of her kids came into assembly in silence. And these are little nursery kids, mm. three years old, up to 10 years old, right? To, okay. Up to year six. And everybody out there would say, oh, primary children, they can't be expected to, be remain, to remain silent. Well, I tell you, for 35 minutes, those children, three years old upwards, sat in silence, right? Mm. And concentrated on what we were saying. And the fact is, if you have your expectations high, the children will reach that. Yeah. So, I, and it's the culture. And she has mm. created a culture where those, the expectations are that you come into the assembly in silence and you remain in silence. And so they do. If you don't have that culture, they won't. And so, and that becomes a habit. Of and course. then over many, many years, this is what that child can then do naturally and expect mm-hmm. of himself. Yeah. Uh, so habit and culture are just, you know, the, the two concepts that I think too often people just don't understand. And um, they think, you know, so they look at these kids and they go, oh, well, you misbehave because you're poor. I know what we need. We need to just pour money into this education Mm, system mm. and that will make it better for you. And look, I'm not saying I couldn't do with more money. I'd love more money from the government, right? Of course, (laughs) uh, (coughs) I'd love sports hall. I'd love grass and trees for the kids. I mean, look, I'm never going to turn down more money, but that is not the thing that's going to fix our school system, right? What will fix our school system is the values and 
and I, and I think, I do think they are small C conservative values. Uh, I do think 50, 60 years ago, these values existed on the left. Mm -hmm. I think weirdly, do, certainly do you, the left. Do you think you even have to go back that far? Sorry, do you think you even have to go back that far? No, no. Well, I, I mean, I'd say that they were deteriorating from the 60s, mm -hmm. but it is true that in the last 10 to 15 years, everyone's gone mad on the yeah. left. I don't understand what is, what is happening. <laughs> I, don't, I just don't understand it. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is that there are a few, you find Catholics, you know, there's some Catholics who are on the left who are still very traditional mm. and, and would agree with most of what I'm saying here. But I mean, I don't understand what's happened to them all. Mm. You know, like it used to be the case that it was just understood that children like discipline and thrived in order and structure. Um, I, I don't get it. It's, well, I say I don't get it. You were asking why do they do this? I think mm. it's the guilt. They're so uncomfortable with their own privilege mm. that um, they find holding children to account who are from different backgrounds than they are from, they find that really hard. Yeah. And, uh, <coughs> it goes past children though, doesn't it? Cause they do the same to adults in many cases. Yeah. Well, they do it to me. Definitely. Yeah. So I, I find too often because I'm black, they think that I should be grateful to them and that I should think in a particular kind of way. I should mm. vote in a particular kind of way. And, um, I always say, look, I'm a floating voter. I will mm. vote for whoever I think is the candidate that I want at every particular election. Yeah. Um, I'm a thinking person. You know, some of my ideas are left-leaning. <coughs> some of them are right-leaning. Um, How dare you? My values are very much small C conservative. I would, and I, my own opinion is that actually I think that many people on the right do not have small C conservative values. You know, I think too many people on the right don't. You know, okay. I, I do worry when, about when, our society. When you, when you say that, what do you mean? Okay, so, um, yeah, I mean, I suppose in America, because I mean, I, I, I keep referring to America with you, even though I know you're not from America, you spend a lot of time <laughs> in America. Yeah. Um, and I know a lot of your listeners and so on are from America. Sure. Um, I suppose conservatives in America, uh, they do believe in small C conservative values. And what I mean by that is they believe in the power of family. Mm -hmm. They believe that... Um, fathers not being around has impact on children. Mm. Uh, they believe in, um, they might be relatively religious, right? So when I yeah. say religious, they believe in the kind of traditions that religion would bring along. Um, mm -hmm. So um, uh, reciting, re re reciting hymns, you know, singing hymns together and knowing those hymns together. Uh, I was about to say reciting poetry, but that's the kind of tradition that you might do at school and something sure. that we do at school here. Um, so yes, I think that's true. I think that there are, no, but I think in America too, I'm talking about the people who are on the right in terms of their economics. So okay. they believe in uh, the free market and mm -hmm. um, they believe in as much freedom as possible when it comes to the market. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I don't really know what I think about all that stuff about the economy because I'm not, I mean, it's not my expertise. Mm. So if you ask me what I thought about the free market, look, I, I do believe generally in people having freedom, obviously. I say obviously not these days. Not <laughs> but I do. Not, not a given, um, yeah. <laughs> no, no, it isn't. But um, I'm not an expert on that. When I okay. talk about small conservative values, I'm talking about social conservatives. Social conservatism. I'm, yeah, I'm talking about um, belief in uh, duty to other people, mm. uh, duty to your family and to your community. Uh, a sense of paying back what you owe, that one should always look to how people have helped you and, uh, and be grateful for that. I, we believe very much in gratitude here at Michaela. Oh, so yeah. we teach the children to be grateful to their parents. You know, the most amazing thing yesterday, I was listening in appreciations. There's this black boy, tall black boy, good looking boy, you know, um, who's naughty. And, you know, I really thought, you know, if that kid were anywhere else, I'm sure he'd be on a list for it to be excluded, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, all the girls fancy him and so on and so on. And he stood up in the appreciations and he said he wanted to thank his mum for waking him up that morning and how she was such a great mum. And I just thought, in front of 180 kids, here's this boy thanking his mother. Like, you have to understand, that's, that's like, it's, 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 it's inconceivable in an inner city <laughs> school that yeah. that would happen, right? Okay. And um, so that, small C conservative values, you know, social conservatism, uh, uh, thinking that that gratitude is good. Mm -hmm. um, gratitude is a very good one, actually, to, to explain, actually. Here's, here's a good one. When you say, well, why do they think like this? So <coughs> I think too many people on the left 
look at that and think, teaching this black boy to be grateful is to teach him to be, um, not to fight back, fight mm. back against the racist system. So what I mean by that is, we teach that boy to be grateful, not just to his mom, but mm -hmm. to his teachers, to his country. Mm -hmm. We teach the kids, and when I say be grateful to your country, what I mean by that is, um, you could have been born in a country where, you know, uh, you don't have a welfare state to support you, where you don't have free health care, where you don't have oh, free you don't even, schooling. You don't even need to go that far. Running water. Um, yeah, for instance, exactly. To to toilets, yeah, exactly. Elect electricity that's constant, yeah. Exactly. So all that stuff, you've got to be grateful to your country. We yeah. sing God Save the Queen. Now, in America, that's not so controversial because everybody's all about God bless America. Yeah, I yeah. tell you, and everybody sings the national anthem. In this country, half the kids don't even know what the national anthem is. I mean, I'm telling you, <laughs> they... I, 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 we laugh, but you know, yeah. I once went oh. to India with a bunch of other teachers, British teachers, we went to India. And in this Indian school, which is an amazing charity school, doing extraordinary things with Dalit children there, um, the kids all got up and sang the national anthem. And it went on and on and on, and we were there, and we were all crying practically, and tears in our eyes, isn't this the most beautiful thing? Poor Indian children singing. And then the children turned around and said, now it's the teacher's turn from Britain. You will stand and you will sing your national anthem. Oh, wow. And all of us teachers, we all looked at each other <laughs> and thought, oh my goodness, we don't know our national anthem. Oh, wow. Well, how are we going to do this? And honestly, it was so embarrassing. We got up and we just about managed the first verse of God Save the Queen. <laughs> we just about managed it. Yeah. And then we all sat down. And the, well, of course, there's several verses, right? But we all just yeah, sat yeah. down. And the Indian children said, that was very short. And <laughs> so the fact is, it was absurd. These yeah. Indian children all know their national anthem. We teachers don't even know our national anthem. Mm -hmm. Now, we all sing our national anthem here. I have to say we only sing two verses, but we sing two verses of the national anthem because otherwise it would take too long. So that's why we only do two. But <coughs> people come here. This is totally controversial, right? It is, I know in America it's normal, but here it is totally controversial uh, because nobody does it. Yeah. And, um, well, or it's quite rare. I don't want to say nobody, but it's very rare to do that. Yeah. And I come back to the point about teaching a black boy gratitude, teaching a black boy to love his country, teaching a black boy to sing God Save the Queen. Um, I think, for instance, this, uh, the, the annoyance that some people feel with that is teaching black people to be grateful to this white state, right? And that makes them feel uncomfortable. Oh, sorry, that's our, our lesson changeover pips that are, that are ringing, but they'll stop. Uh -huh. um, uh, they, they, they feel uncomfortable with that because in order to fight back against the racist state, mm. you have to oppose it. But, you have to- Sorry, to, to jump in here, is, is it- Yeah. Would it be presumptuous to me to say that most of the people who feel this way and have a problem with it are white people themselves? Because that's what I've certainly noticed with these sort of super woke progressive types is that a lot of them seem to be, you know, <laughs> they're, they're white people themselves, but they're the ones who want to sort of demonize white people and white culture and racialize everything. And yeah, like kind of do this weird self-flagellation thing, whereas lots of other people are just yeah. like, what are you even, what are you even talking about? They'll racialize things that you yourself aren't even viewing through still hearing lens. me i can hear you yeah fine. yeah okay if you just you cut off a couple uh, a okay. couple of times that was okay so just say the essence of what you're saying again oh there sorry too. no because because you were talking about um <laughs> people deeming what you said controversial and i said i don't want to be presumptuous but i know in my own experience what i find very bizarre with that is it's typically white people who are having yeah. a problem with that kind of thing it's these you know super woke yes progressive Types for me, so sorry, yeah, look, the signal's cutting yeah, out a little bit. Uh, yeah, it's just I think the internet. Look, okay. I tell you, my, my opinion on that is that if you are poor, if you have, um, you know, you're trying to make it in life, mm -hmm. you are too busy working, paying your mortgage, trying to get your kids to school, sitting down and reading with your child at home, you're too busy doing all of that to participate in woke progressive politics. Yeah. It's only the privilege to participate in that because oh, they're bored. Yeah. So, you know, there are no wars going on for them. You know, they're not counting the pennies. They've got this nice life. They feel guilty about it. So they go around participating in woke progressive politics because mm. they have time for it. 
The mm. rest of us don't have time for it because we're too busy trying to survive, right? Yeah. Um, I'm too busy running my school and trying to save the lives of these kids who they apparently care about. Mm. And they are undermining me. That's what they yeah. don't understand. And what do, and what, do, you, do, you, yeah. do you think they don't understand it? This, this is the thing. I mean, because um, I'm not someone who has, I know we've spoken before, and I'm not someone who's really shifted much um, in terms of sociopolitical views over my entire lifetime. Right. And one thing I, I have noticed, you know, both online and offline is, <coughs> you know, I like to go around the world assuming that everybody has good intentions. But when I, when I deal with some of these people, I struggle to continue to believe that they all have good motives and intentions because, yeah. you know, and I think, yeah. the dead, I think the dead giveaway is how they treat and talk to people such as myself, such as yourself, who are, mm. you know, inverted commas, people of color, because they love that word. Yes. I don't use that term, right? Black people, um, minorities, even women yeah. who don't go along 100% with everything they're saying. It's like all of a sudden yeah. the mask falls off and they suddenly become very, very racist and very, very sexist and whatever. And yes. so, so I when I see that, and, I, and I've, I've dealt with this hundreds of times to the point mm. where I'm like, I'm struggling to believe that you're really oh you just really want the best for me or you really want the best for us yeah. or this community or whatever i do yes. think that it's you know it, it's a bullying tactic it's you know genu genuine racism in in many cases um, yeah that's right it is racist big, they are racist low, yeah bigotry of low expectations right. it's this idea yeah. i almost call it I've, I've started calling it like left wing white white supremacy because it's like yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You, you still think you're superior it's just yes. you, you, you're just doing it from a slightly different angle, which makes you sort of sound woke and progressive. Yeah. But if you look at even the results of what you are proposing, you're looking at the results of the policies you're proposing. Yeah. What you're yeah. doing is you're decimating these families. You're making That's it right. worse for these children. You're making things worse. Yes. And yes. so I struggle to think, you know, I do think, yeah, sure, there's some people who are misguided and have good intentions, but there are people there who I think like, kind of know what they're doing but they're sort of getting away with it just because of the way that culture has allowed them to. <laughs> well, I don't know if they know what they're doing. I think, mm. I think that they don't follow it through. They don't care because what motivates them is uh, being able to sit at a dinner party and feel like they are good people. Yeah. The, the thing, they want to feel good and being good means having certain leftist progressive uh, politics. And so they have those politics, not because they're actually looking at the evidence and seeing whether or not it works, but because it allows them to be, a certain, to be seen as a certain kind of person. I would say my teachers, 90% yeah. of them, once upon a time, they were woke progressives, okay. right? Uh, people can change their minds. Uh, and I have found, not just with my teachers, but uh, on Twitter, you know, people say to me, why are you on Twitter? Because I have to say to you, I hate Twitter. But well, I, hate Twitter. <laughs> I mean, I have met some interesting people. I met you actually of off Twitter. So, yeah. you know, there are some good things, but you know, people say to me, oh, you know, you're on Twitter all the time. And one of the reasons why I am is because I've had many people say to me, look, I've been following you for a few years and I've been listening to what you say. And I used to think what you were saying was crazy. Mm -hmm. And now I've changed my mind and I'm with you now. And I know from my own teachers, all of the work that we do here in school, my teachers have shifted. Uh, now, some of them, I mean, they all think different things. Obviously, course, they're not yeah, all yeah. thinking. And they get what I'm saying. Mm. And they see it because they see it in the kids. They see it in the families. They see the difference that they make. They see the difference that our policies make here at school for these kids in comparison to the more liberal policies that you might find elsewhere. Mm. And so... I do believe people can change their minds. I agree with you that there's a hardcore set of people out there yeah. who are not interested in changing because they're not interested in their children. They, they, they are actually motivated by their own sense of uh, self-worth mm. and wanting to feel like they are the great white savior coming in to save these poor black people or oh, yeah. the poor white people up in the north or whoever it is. You know, they, oh, they, don't, they don't care about them. No. Exactly. <laughs> they, don't, they don't care about that. And, and that's why they're not listening. Because I always think to myself, listen, I've had over 20 years experience of working in the inner city. You experience of doing this, but I'm actually doing a good job with them. Mm. <laughs> right? So uh, why don't you listen to me? You know, like, why don't you just sit back and go, you know what? 
I don't know this stuff. I don't know the kind of damage that, um, I mean, you'll have seen me tweeting recently about Stormzy and his musical lyrics and the, <laughs> the, 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 the outrageous music that, um, that various woke progressives support mm -hmm. that destroy the lives of my, my inner city children, you know? Um, I, why not listen to me? Why not listen to the arguments and think, well, you know what? It's true. I, I don't really know black kids in the inner city. Yeah. I don't know what it's like to, to be a black kid and, 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 and hear, uh, you know, women being referred to as sluts and bitches and so on. And, and, and is it possible to hear that constantly and not become, uh, not have a difficult relationship with women when I'm older as a, as yeah. a young black man or as a young black girl mm -hmm. hearing myself being referred to as a bitch and a slut all the time? Maybe that makes, would that make me as a young black girl feel like actually I'm a bit worthless? Yeah. You know, like, I don't understand why if I'm saying to you, I've got 20 years experience, I, yeah. this is all I deal with. And yeah. this is what I see happens to my kids, you know? And then they say, where is your evidence? Where is your yeah. data? Like, what do you mean, where is my data? I mean, yeah. this is ridiculous. I'm telling you, <laughs> this is what I see every day. Now, why would I make it up, right? Yeah. Why would I lie? I'm telling you this because my yeah. kids are suffering. So can you listen head. to me, please? See, this is the thing. This is, this is how I know they don't care. This yeah. is how I know they don't care because yeah. like, I've been dealing with this for <laughs> such a long time and I'm glad that more and more people are starting to see it because I used to try to sort of explain this to people and this hard, sort of soft bigotry of low expectations kind of thing, but not just that, mm -hmm. but the responses of, you know, like I said, especially like if you think these people really, really like black people or really, really like minorities or whatever. I'm like, okay, go, go be one of them and disagree with them and see, see what they say to you. You see what I mean? And it's like, wow, yes. if, you, if that was really where you were coming from, if that was really where your heart was, why, why is your first reaction to me or to you or to any, to, I don't know, in the US you have people like uh, Candace Owens being an obvious example, right? Why is it that mm. when you get someone who is black and leans more conservative or libertarian and is giving a different perspective, your automatic thing is to call them a racial slur or to try to call them a race traitor or demean mm. them or denigrate them in some way. Why wouldn't you <coughs> go, oh, okay, let me, let me listen here because I care about fixing the problem, right? If, you're, if your goal yeah. is, if you're genuinely worried about uh, young, young black men in London or Chicago or Baltimore or wherever, and you're worried about these communities and you're worried about all these young boys and girls growing up without fathers in their homes or fathers in prison and drugs in their communities or whatever, why would you lash out at the people who are genuinely trying to address it and sort of say, yeah. oh, look, this is, this is what's going on. That, that's why I struggle yeah. to think. Not, again, I don't want to paint with a total brush, right? You know, I do think most people have good intentions, but there are certainly certain people on that side who I'm like, you're not you're, 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 as, you're as bad as the people on the other side. You're just being less obvious about it. Well, actually, I think it's worse. And the yeah. reason why I think that it's worse is because everybody knows that the guy wearing the white hood is a bad guy. Exactly, right? exactly. And everybody knows that the guys, you know, these white nationalists marching up and down, singing their craziness, I don't know. Mm -hmm. First of all, mm -hmm. they're a minority. That's yes. the other thing. They're, they're not a tolerated. real minority. They're not tolerated. And, and nobody wants anything to do with them. And we all know that they're bad. The problem is, is that these woke progressives, there's loads of them yeah. and they are, they, they, there's not only loads of them, but everybody thinks that they are the good guys, mm. but they're the bad guys. Yeah. And I mean, they are the ones I'm fighting. Yeah. They are genuinely <laughs> it's, it's fighting. So weird. Yeah. And it's madness yeah. that I'm having to fight progressives on making the lives of inner city children better. And I'm having to fight them on musical lyrics. I'm having to fight them on discipline in mm -hmm. terms of uh, behavior. Mm -hmm. I'm having to fight them in terms of uh, what we teach them in lessons, that knowledge should be central and the teacher should stand up. I have to fight them on everything. And yeah. you know what? The fight is exhausting. Yeah. I have to say, I'm absolutely exhausted by it. And, 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 I you're, mean, and you're the expert as well. That's the crazy thing. You're the expert. Well, <laughs> I, about, I always turn around to them and I say, okay, so I've spent over 20 years yeah. working my, I'm working myself to the bone. I mean, every single day, 6.30, 7 o'clock in my entire career, I've had one day off, right? Wow. One day off for severe tooth pain. That was the only thing, right? <laughs> I've, one day in over 20 years I've had off. Yeah. And you know why? Because when I'm ill, I drag myself in for those kids because I love them. And I have mm. dedicated my entire life to fighting for these children. So that's what I do. 
what do you do to help these kids? That's what I'd like to know. Because mm -hmm. you go around on Twitter and you say your nonsense and you, 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 you insult the things that I do. So I want to know what you do because I've, I've dedicated my life to, 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 to the fight for, to, to better the lives of these children. So, and you know, there was a time I gave this speech at the Conservative Party conference in uh, 2010. I got myself into a whole load of trouble and ended up without a job because you know, mm -hmm. you really can't do that. Um, in teaching because mm -hmm. you have to be on the left essentially is my opinion on this um, Anyway point is I was told I would never work in the state sector again uh, Because public it's, it, You know for your US audience public schools, you know, which are state schools here uh, You just you can't be on the right as it were and I went and spoke at the conservative party conference even though I'm not actually a member of the conservative the US listeners will be Aaron. familiar with that Sorry, say what did you, I didn't hear? Oh no, you said. I just said U.S. listeners will be familiar with that because the academia situation right. over there is identical. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, exactly. And so I, I was told I couldn't work in the state sector. That's why I had to set up my own school. So wow. we set up Michaela. I set it up because I had to. So it's it's essentially a charter school. You yeah. know, it's a free school here in England. And uh, they started in 2010. Charter schools have been going for a lot longer in America. And I had to start up my own school because the only way that I could work, continue working with disadvantaged children was if I'd set up my own school. And at the time, there was the opportunity to go off and work in the private sector. I could have gone and done that. Mm -hmm. But I thought, I don't want to do that. Because what I know and love are, are disadvantaged kids. It's, yeah. it's, it's my, my life's passion. And mm -hmm. it's what I fight for. So I think I've proved myself with over 20 years in this business. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I've proved where my loyalties lie and what, what motivates me, right? Mm. Uh, these Twitter warriors, uh, keyboard warriors, um, well, I'd like to know what, what you do, really. What yeah. do you do to help? If all you do to help is denigrate people like me, well, mm -hmm. you know what? Here's the, here's the news flash. You're the bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. That's, that's the crazy thing. And I guess with myself as well, you know, being, being a rapper, right, is, yes. you know, to, to go on further with what you're saying is I've seen over the course of, I don't know, 18 years since I've been of listening to hip hop and more than 10 years since I've been making it is you see the way people and even the industry and people in music with power who have the chance to elevate certain voices or give people certain opportunities. It does seem like, okay, there is a, there is a certain way that they want to sell uh, black men and black people. Okay? Yes. And that's exactly if, right. And if you're sending a message out, in hip hop or in rap or whatever that doesn't go along yeah. with a certain narrative, it's going to be a lot harder for you. Yeah. And well, in where... your stuff, I mean, I want you to come in in school, as you know, I want you to come yeah, in and yeah. talk to kids. I think you're absolutely brilliant. Um, I, I, you know, the thing that caught me because I saw you on Twitter and then I went and looked at some of your videos. And yeah. when you said you were the Jordan Peterson of rap, <laughs> I thought, right, I have got to meet this guy. Um, it was so great. And, you know, and the point is, why is your music not being promoted? Instead, they're promoting all this stuff with the N-word. And, mm -hmm. well, I mean, it's just so awful. It's so awful. Like, why would you want black people calling each other nigger? I don't understand yeah. it. Like, yeah. I just don't understand it. It's a yeah. word, you know, all black people. Chris Rock has this great, um, I think it was 1994, he did this great uh, comedy sketch mm -hmm. where he's saying, you know, every, all black people know there are black people and then there are niggas. And then yeah. he talks about the niggas as the people who are unreliable, who are rubbish, who, you know, who interrupt conversations, who swear, who, who behave badly, you know? And um, the fact is, uh, we all know this. And... It was the same in slavery days, for goodness sakes. Yeah. They would distinguish, you know, or in civil rights times, they would distinguish between black people and niggas. You know, and nowadays, well, all black people are niggas, apparently. Mm. And all of us are, <coughs> why do we say the N-word? Yeah. We say the N-word because it's a terrible word. Exactly. And it's crazy that and we are encouraging black children to listen to this stuff. M meanwhile, so we got Stormzy on the BBC. Your US listeners won't know who he is, but it doesn't really matter. He's mm. just one guy. There's a whole bunch of them. There's, oh yeah, you know, it's the same in the, it's, it's, it's the it's the same in the USA. I mean, it's, it's exactly. from the it's from the USA. Where it's black from the murder USA. is being celebrated. Yeah. You know, I would say to everybody, there's this wonderful TED talk by a guy called Michael Smith. Okay. Uh, and if you type in Michael Smith, black murder, something about being normal, but black murder uh, has become normal. Mm -hmm. uh, and Michael Smith is this white guy who gives this wonderful talk on how essentially the system is set up in such a way so that um, uh, black artists, music artists, mm. have to go down that route. Because mm. that is what sells. 
and mm -hmm. they're happy to sell it because all these white kids, white privileged kids buy that music mm -hmm. and make them rich because, and if they're not using those, that kind of language where uh, black girls, let's face it, it's black women they're referring to of course, as, as hoes and bitches and sluts yeah. and so on, right? Yeah. Um, well, it, it doesn't affect them. So it's fine. I, it, the, it, it is so revolting. And, and the thing is, who's buying this music? It's the woke progressives. Mm -hmm. Who's fighting for the fact? Who loves these people? It, it, the it, is, it, is, it is black people too. It is, it is a lot of black people too. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, so when I say woke progressives, yeah, yeah. I would include black people. Oh, in okay. That. Yeah, Both yeah. But just, just, yeah. just generally though, I don't even think it's just, <laughs> I mean, one of the criticisms, I mean, this is the funny thing with me being a, you know, I guess what you could call like a clean rapper is it's really interesting the sort of the criticisms that get le that get levied at me right yes so what, what kind of criticisms it, well it's the same it's the same as the praises right so some people like the fact oh cool i can listen to your music in the car with my uh, kids i like the fact you don't swear i like the fact i can understand what you're saying i like the fact you don't disrespect women you don't rap about violence you don't talk about killing black people you're not doing all this you're not rapping about selling drugs and then there are people who think that my music is soft or fake or corny because I'm not yes. playing into that black male stereotype. And it's really funny because a lot of the same people who want to scream about racism or white supremacy or systemic racism, this institutional, that it's like, look, if those things exist to the, to the degree, <laughs> I think some of those things exist. I think they exist in almost the inverse way that you, yes, right. think, you, that, you think that they do, right? The actual they system. They do exist. Yeah, the systemic the, the, racism. These people are propping is, them up. Yeah, the systemic racism is the yeah. fact that I can't get played on the radio or you don't want to That's play right. my video on TV unless I do have like, That's right. you know, uh, unless I'm, I'm just you, playing up to the caricature. All your listeners have to find Michael Smith, TED Talk, Black Murder, okay? Mm. He, he talks about uh, a particular rapper, I can't remember his name, who um, uh, when he, uh, for Reebok, he... Um, he, re he was fired essentially because he referred to date rape and date rape is something that so that affects oh, the Ross. white community yeah, Rick and Ross. because it affects the white community that was unacceptable and he was mm. fired mm. the fact is that when black people are killing each other when black people are calling each other names and disrespecting women and and uh, this over sexualization uh and, and uh, this hyper i mean it's just it's it's so grotesque and when black children are failing because of it and are, that's the point about habit and culture that I was talking about earlier. Yeah. So if you constantly listen to that kind of music, you use that kind of language. Um, I'm an exception. There's this, what, what's that? I said, I'm an exception. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm saying children. And it's just your normal, the normal expectations. Yeah, yeah. And so the habit of using those words and hearing those words and of thinking boys thinking of girls as bitches and girls thinking of themselves as being worthless, mm. all of them, boys and girls thinking themselves as well, not better than a nigger, you know, that they then don't have very high expectations of themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, parents don't necessarily realize the music is bought. It's not just music, it's the video games. You know, Grand Theft Auto, you can uh, hire a, a pro prostitute. So you are stimulating this in the, the game. I've done you hire before. a prostitute to do a lap dance for you. Mm -hmm. You can then kill that prostitute later mm -hmm. in the game. Yeah. So my kids are killing prostitutes. I mean, like, in what world is this? <laughs> understand yeah. and whenever i'm kind of arguing against this i always get some crazy lefty who's telling me oh no kids need to be able to do whatever they want etc kids should lead their own learning no mm. they should not lead their own learning i mean i don't do you, understand. do you want know, do, do you want to know my take on this thing with the whole entertainment stuff especially yeah. as somebody who you know has played through many grand theft auto games and who's been listening to <coughs> you know all sorts of filthy hip-hop uh for right. since i was like 13 and i don't even i don't even swear um, the thing is people, kids need parents. Yeah. Right. So well, I was about I'm, to say, yeah, exactly. You had some so African parents. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like all of this entertainment, whether it's in music or movies or video games or, or whatever, I think that, you know, that, that's certainly not, that's certainly not the root. It's something that I think can exacerbate an existing issue in, in certain cases. But I think more generally, it's like, look, loads of people consume these things and they're fine. They're functional. They're not behaving in this manner. They're not going out and doing There's plenty of things I've done in video games that I wouldn't dream of doing in real life because I have that separation between, OK, this is just this is just a bit of fun. This is entertainment and this is reality. 
But I know yeah. a lot of that does stem from, you know, one, my own personality, but also my parents, my family, the way I was raised and everything. So my parents- Well, could, and you're you know, in school. Could, sorry? You, got to, you, you were brought up in Saudi Arabia, right? Uh, yeah, for, to begin with, yeah. yeah. And so the school that you went to will be nothing like the inner city schools around, That's you know, in, in my life, right? Mm -hmm. Kids in, in, in schools that can be chaotic, in classrooms that can be chaotic, they are growing up, when they're going home, there are all sorts of kids from elsewhere who live a certain kind of lifestyle, walk in a certain kind of way. It's mm -hmm. very intimidating and aggressive. Um, in order for them to survive, now that's not the case at our school because we've created a real oasis. And there are other schools that have done that too. So I'm not mm -hmm. saying we're the only one. But, um, but they, in order for them to survive on the street, they have to become a thug. They have to. Because yeah. uh, if they don't walk in that way, then they will get attacked. Mm -hmm. And if they don't... Uh, carry a knife well somebody else is going to carry a knife yeah. um and if they don't uh, refer to women in a certain kind of way then then they are seen as weak mm -hmm. and they will get bullied or attacked or you know all sorts of things will happen and, to them. and those and, they, and the women won't be attracted to them either that's the crazy that, part. that, that yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. And so that culture, this is the point about the weight of the culture. Yep. Now, if you grow up as you did in a culture that isn't like that, mm -hmm. both at your school, in your community, and with your family, you are then protected from that culture. So you can dip in and listen to Snoop Dogg or whoever it is and, and, and go, oh, this is fun, and then yeah. come out of it, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, I, just like a white kid would. So when we talk about privileged white kids, you were like a privileged white kid in that sense, mm -hmm. right? Um, cannot detach themselves from it they can't it becomes part of who they are it becomes part of their culture and when you are immersed in that culture all of the time those habits grow over years and that lack of self-worth we all talk about self-esteem in the black community and about how black kids don't have enough self-esteem well you know what if everybody refers to you as a bitch and a nigger i, I can see why yeah. you don't have much self-esteem i just wish people would listen and that's what i said about that michael mm. smith guy he does a great job of arguing it um, the thing that I would say to people is when they listen to this, uh, you know, recording us, our conversation, um, they have to ask themselves, why would I be saying all of this if it weren't true? Yeah. Right. Uh, I, when I gave my, um, my speech at the conservative party conference, which your listeners can always, uh, Google on YouTube, um, you know, so many people accused me of wanting to be a politician. They said, well, you've obviously done this because you want to be a conservative politician. And I said, I don't want to be a conservative politician. I mean, well, why would I want to do that? Yeah. Oh, I just want to be a teacher. That the reason I was saying what I was saying was because it is true, yeah. right? The reason I say everything that I say is because it is true. Yeah. I don't have any ulterior motives. Uh, if I wanted to be a conservative politician, I could have become one. Yeah. I haven't become one. Look, I'm still in the school. Why? <laughs> Because it's what I believe in, right? Yeah. And I'm begging you to listen to me. I'm yeah. begging you to stop doing what you're doing so that my kids can have a chance in life. Mm. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, it, it is, it does amaze me. It does amaze me. I mean, it was interesting over the last couple of weeks seeing, watching your Twitter account and seeing who was attacking you and how they were attacking yeah. you and seeing what they were, yeah. seeing what they were sticking up for as opposed to what you were sticking up for. And I was kind of yeah. like, you know, I responded a couple to a couple things, I think, but I was like, this is very, this is very interesting. And this is very telling, right? This yes. Is, this is very, very telling here, especially when you have these people who are like, oh, we need to listen more to female voices of color. Right? I know. We need more black women to it's speak so up. We know. And then, I mean, I, I follow, I know, I know both in the UK and US, right? I follow lots of, uh, I follow lots of prominent black Republicans and black conservatives in the UK who have decent sized followings and <coughs> constant stream of attack, 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 like on yeah. them, right. On yeah. young black women in the U S or in the UK or young black. And I'm just like, this is just making my point. Like this is yeah. literally what I'm saying. And it's just, it just amazes me. It's like, you know, we want, we want diversity. We love that. We, you know, we want these people to speak up. We want women to speak up. We want black people. And then it's like, as soon as, they go slightly, they veer off. Yeah. Of, oh, it's like, oh, no, you, you weren't meant to say that, right? Yeah, that's right. You, you said a true thing there. Like, don't say true things. Like, talk about that's how, right. talk about white man bad. Talk about, you know, your struggles with racism. Don't, 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 come, right. out and, don't come out and say Britain's not a racist country. That's the, 
man, I remember, <laughs> I remember one time I wrote a, a tweet where I said, um, I said that, um, <coughs> how, how did I word it? I said that we live in one of the least racist countries in the world. Yeah. One of the least racist periods in history. Yes. And I got, man, the responses. Uh, I can some imagine. People, some people were just like, yeah, of course. Right. <laughs> and then other people were like, oh, like going crazy. And I was like, why do you want, do you know what I mean? It's like, why, why would you want to not believe that? Firstly, it's true. Right. If you don't think it's true, tell me yeah. which decade you would like yes. to go back to or tell me which. And again, I think you, with a lot of people, because they haven't been anywhere else in the world. So they have this yes. picture of like the US or the UK is like horribly, terribly racist. And I'm like, what are you even comparing to? Right. Yeah, family, that's right. My family background is from Nigeria. I mean, even within Nigeria itself, amongst the different ethnic groups and tribes, like certain people won't want to like intermarry or, ha or do business with each other or whatever. And that's within the same country this is amongst people yeah. who almost look the same <laughs> and that's yeah. the same or try going to yeah. i don't know uh, various asian countries yeah. go to eastern europe as a black yeah. person and see how you get treated it's just it, it's mad i mean look they, they i don't know it's some weird pathology i don't understand it, it and you know strange. what's also interesting is that they don't understand okay the black people can think differently so you and i, I know we've spoken before i mean you are a, a trump supporter i am not a trump supporter <laughs> You know, I love but it. we're still friends. <laughs> like you can Trump him, support him, and I can not support him, and we don't hate each other. Uh, my U.S. Uh, followers uh, support Trump. They, I'm quite public about the fact that I don't support Trump, but they don't stop following me. You know, they're quite happy to go. Okay, fine. You have to admit, he, and, you have to admit, he's better than all the other options. Surely. Well, I mean, it is true that the <laughs> Democrats are. I have to say, Bloomberg might give him a bit of a run for his money. Bloomberg, but I mean, uh, yeah, I, yes, okay. I mean, it is. It is mad. The thing yeah. is, something <laughs> has gone wrong with the left. I don't know what's happened to them. I don't. I don't understand it. Um, I, I mean, I'd love to see a great, you know, Democrat uh, possibility. But they're. Yeah. But you're right. Like, I don't. I don't understand see, it. It's this, just, this, that's the thing. I mean, people. People. <laughs> I mean, I don't. I don't call myself personally a Trump supporter. I try to be like objective and fair to him because I do think he gets very, very unfairly maligned and treated and the amount of the media lies about him and stuff like really blatantly. It's, 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 he's not scrutinized yeah. like other presidents have been. Does he have his flaws? Sure. But in terms of actual policies and achievements and what he's objectively done, you know, like people get distracted. Yeah, I might agree with you. People, people get distracted yeah. by, oh, he said this on Twitter or whatever. I'm like, I don't care what he said on Twitter. Like, he's just wow. done. So there we go. Yeah. You know, we were That's talking about small C conservatism. Yeah. So it is because I am a small C conservative mm. that I am not a supporter of Trump. And mm. that is because I just, I cringe often when he yeah. speaks. And well, yeah, fine. But I'm also interested in his behavior towards women. Yeah. I'm interested in how he tweets. In fact, I kind of cringe that he's tweeting at all as the U.S. president. You know, you can't just go on Twitter as the U.S. president at 4 a.m. and just tweet out some nonsense. Oh, you said this about me. Well, I'm going to say this about you. I just, oh, yeah. like, it's, I'm sorry. You know, if Trump were here at Michaela at Aunt I school, he would be in <laughs> detention all of the time. You know, <laughs> he really would. I would have him in detention all of the time. You know, <laughs> I... I I, I can't be dealing with half the things he's doing, That's you know? Brilliant. So yeah, I, I'm a small C conservative. <laughs> I, I'm, I just imagining you having, I'm imagining you having having Trump just sitting <laughs> sitting there with a with a, a dunce cap on his head. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> taking his taking his phone and Twitter away from him. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Oh, indeed. Gosh. Someone but, needs to take his phone away from him. It's so funny. Because you know I got invited to the White House last year. I didn't get a chance to meet the president, but um I did. I was talking to people who work work very closely with him, and um, I I know this isn't really insider information, but people should know that he is a lot more self aware than people realize. Like he he he's in on the joke. He he's right. in on the whole joke. Like yeah, but then knows. it's his responsibility. Yeah. Look, yeah. Stormzy and all those rap artists. I, I, I'm critical in the same way. Yeah. You, sure. you as U.S. president, you are a role model, right? Mm -hmm. And I need to be able to say to my little kids, you know, be like him. Now, I'm not saying they're going to be perfect. Obviously, there's no politician out there who's perfect. No. But who's so blatantly ridiculous mm -hmm. in some of the things that he does and says. Yeah. I can't put up with that. I just can't. Yeah. The thing um, is, see, he, I, it's, it's such a funny one because I, I, I understand everything you're saying. Because my, my, parents, my parents have a very similar position on him, right? Right. And the thing is, because of the current 
climate and the current culture and because of his opposition and the way the media treat him. Yeah. It, to me, it's like you, you kind of have to take the total package because all of that stuff is part of his effectiveness. It's part of his popularity. It's part of why, like, because because he just craps on the whole political correct stuff. Maybe he can yeah. take it too far, sure. But people like the fact. I mean, it's it it, it does polarize people because some people are like, "Oh, that's not presidential," right? But yeah. other people are like, "Oh my gosh!" Like he just tweeted like this meme of him like <laughs> body slamming CNN, or you know, like just just some totally crazy stuff, or like the meme he put up of him being president um, for for all time. I don't know if you, mm. I don't know if you saw that one or when he put up the yeah. Trump Tower on Greenland, right? Like stuff like that. You know, he's had maybe like three or four. I've been like, mm, that's that's crossed the line. But most of them, it's just it's just funny. And he knows it gets such a strong reaction. It drives his opposition insane. It drives the media. No, insane. I get that. So, but it's the same thing as mm. um, the black rap artist sure. who is appealing to the lowest common denominator because he's going to be able to sell records. You know. Mm. Um, and he doesn't think about the damage that he's doing to those children when he does yeah. that. Similarly with Trump, I mean, I'm not saying that he's, you know, the same yeah, yeah. as a black rap artist, but I'm just saying the same, uh, you well, know, the black, same Those black idea. rap artists used to love him until 2016. Right. <laughs> but he, I don't know if you um, know how popular he was in hip hop. Oh, really? He was very popular. Yeah, Trump was oh, very right. popular in hip hop. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, it's just the same, the same notion of when you are a role model. So I'm a role model, for instance. Mm. So I don't wear mini skirts anymore. I mean, I'm also in my mid forties, but <laughs> I, I don't wear them because yeah. if the kids ever saw me, that would be really shocking. Every time I, we, any of us teachers, we have a, uh, we have to cross the street up at, on the bridge and there's a green and red man. You have to wait. Mm -hmm. And you know, I might arrive at school, you know, 6am, 6.30am is when I cut school, you know, and it doesn't matter. There are no kids around, but I don't care. I wait until the green man is there because I am never gonna let those kids see me cross on the red man. It'll mm. never happen. And you know, sometimes when I'm in town, and I do, if the truth be told, I sometimes <laughs> cross the street, and um, it's the red man, or I'm not even at an intersection, I just cross in the middle and I jaywalk. I know, it's terrible, isn't it? Um, it's like Theresa May but, running through the cornfield. But you know what, whatever I do it, I always think, I hope none of the kids are around, <laughs> you know, because I have to be a role model. Yeah, yeah. And, it's when you are the president of the United States, when you are a rap artist, mm. when you are in a position where people are watching you, yeah. you have got to be aware of how you're behaving mm. because children are watching. And that's what I'd say to all your listeners who are parents, your children are watching you and your children are copying you. They will copy the way you speak. They will copy the things you do. If you're on your phone all the time, they will be on their phone all the time. Mm -hmm. If you're reading with them all the time, they will read. Um, if you smoke, you know, like all of this stuff, Mm -hmm. matters children copy that's how Absolutely. they learn Absolutely. and that's why i can't get behind trump i do no, understand yeah. why why some people are yeah. and i and i do take the point that you say you know he just kind of bulldozes through all that crazy yeah. you know extreme he, leftist he, he rubbish does. totally and and I, and I do get that people want that and, yeah. and they're frustrated by all the madness that has mm -hmm. been happening so i i kind of i get it i just can't get behind it <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, that's fair enough. I mean, and, and to me, it's also like, the thing is, if he did moderate, it, it wouldn't matter. Like his opposition will still hate him. People like people won't, the yeah, media will still hate you. You see what I mean? Yeah. It's almost like, well, yeah. in his position, if, if he started being more presidential, he, it's not going to win him anything because they, they've already decided they hate him. They've decided he's this. They've yeah. decided there's nothing he can do that yes. would appease them. So. No as far as I'm concerned, it's like, I will keep popping off at them. You know, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just sitting here watching, watching the show. Um, well, that's right. You don't need to watch soap operas anymore for yeah, entertainment. I just, I just, just kind of sit Trump. back and watch the show. So yeah. that's why like I myself wouldn't, you know, I don't, uh, I don't own a MAGA hat or anything. I have thought of, I did think of buying one just to wear it in Whole, Whole Foods in LA and San Francisco to see, <laughs> see if anyone would say anything. Um, but yeah, but I do know a ton of like, you know, very, very vocal Trump supporters, as well as I know, yeah. you know some very vocal people who are opposed to him. I, I can understand both sides. I just think, yes. that, I don't think you can view him in a, in a vacuum. I think in a vacuum, or if he's isolated, I, mo I agree with you a lot more, but kind of in the wider context of everything else, in the wider context of the media, where the culture has been going for the last couple of decades, where um, his, his opposition are, in, in the grand scheme of things, 
like I would vote for him. No question. Like not even, I wouldn't even have to hesitate. Right. You see what right, I mean? Right, right, right. Um, does it mean I approve of everything he said and he's done and that I think he's this, you know, angel or anything? Far, far mm. from it, in fact. But I just, yes. think, I just think he's the man for the job, given where we are right now. That, yeah. That's how yeah, I know. I can see yeah. why you think that. Yeah, that, 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 uh, that, that, that's great, how I look at it. Like, this is what's so nice. Here are two black people who disagree with each other, who can disagree <laughs> politely, who can have a nice conversation, and who can also think things that are a little bit different from what, um, well, what, what the woke progressives think <laughs> black people ought to think, you yeah, know? Yeah. Um, I, you know, and I just want to say to them, can you just please treat us like human beings? You know, we're just like you. We have different ideas. We have disagreements. Um, you know, I have a lot of, I have black friends and not one of us thinks the same as the other one. You know, Why I mean, uh, I don't understand it. Um, I, I just want to be treated like a human being. And um, the thing is, <coughs> when you don't allow me to think the way that I do um, and only promote certain black thinkers, you are being racist. That's what I, I want them to understand. Yeah. And the, you, you think you're not racist, then, uh, but you're, it's, just not, it's just not the case. Mm. And I just want you to open up. I want them to open up their minds and try and consider that maybe what they're doing is wrong. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I yeah. yeah. You know, and it's interesting. You said you thought this way all your life. You know, I haven't. I mm -hmm. used to be very much on the left. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in a very lefty household um, in the way that, you know, ethnic minorities, even though they might be small C conservatives in the way they do, do things in yeah. terms of their values, they very much vote on the left. <laughs> and um, I used to believe that conservatives were really evil. I genuinely thought they were, <laughs> they were evil people. And it wasn't until I started blogging in 2004, 2005, mm. that uh, people would start uh, discussing on my blog through the comments, because there was no Twitter in those days, so they yeah. discussed through the comments. And then I'd realized that I kept on agreeing with the conservatives. <laughs> and it was the conservatives who liked my blog, and I kept yeah. being attacked by people on the left. And, um, and I kept saying to the ones on the left, no, 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 I'm a good person. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not a conservative. And then, I slowly came to realize that actually maybe I just was a conservative and it took me years, yeah. took me years to come to terms with that, you know, mm -hmm. because I had been so brainwashed into thinking that conservatives were evil. And, and then I just changed. And, mm -hmm. um, and even now, you know, even now when I say I'm a small C conservative, I've got conservative values. There's a little thing inside me that, you know, that, <laughs> it's a little bit of a niggle, you know, it doesn't feel right. Cause I feel like, Ooh, ooh can I say that word? Yeah. You know? Um, I've changed my mind because of what life has taught me and because yeah. of what I've seen and because I've been open-minded and, um, and that is what I suppose I, I, I'm trying to ask others to do mm -hmm. uh, and that sometimes I can be a bit bombastic and sometimes I can you know you can people might roll their eyes and think oh there she goes again yeah. um, but the reason why I'm ranting the reason why I'm angry is because I'm seeing the failure of those ideologies those leftist ideologies every single day and I've been yeah. doing that for over 20 years and it breaks my heart. My kids, I love them. I love my kids. I and I it. want them to succeed. Yeah. And I, I've given my whole life to them. And so I just, I want people to listen to me because, because I want their help. You know, I need their help to change the culture because mm -hmm. culture is so powerful, you know? Absolutely. And uh, yeah, you know, that, that, that's, that's what I want from, from, from your listeners. Although the thing is, I keep saying your listeners, I, you know, I suspect many of your listeners are conservative. <laughs> so I'm already preaching to the converted. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Catherine Burble saying, thank you so much for coming on the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. Before we go, let the listeners know where they can find you online. Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, on Twitter, which is where I am, uh, I'm not anywhere else. Uh, I miss Snuffy. So miss and then an underscore snuffy. Uh, and uh, the reason why you may remember Sesame Street in the day, well, there was Mr. Snuffleupagus. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Snuffleupagus was this big <laughs> mammoth elephant uh, and Big Bird was best friends with him. And he would always be talking to Mr. Snuffleupagus. And then when anybody on the street came along, uh, Mr. Snuffleupagus would disappear because he was the elephant in the room. And okay. so when I started my blog 10 years, 15 years ago, whatever it was, um, I decided to call myself 
uh, miss Snuffleupagus because I was talking about things that are in education that nobody wants to talk about. Uh, okay. And then over time on my blog, I became Miss Snuffy. So when I started my Twitter, I kept, I, I, I kept that, that, that title and I'm, I, I remain as Miss Snuffy. And I also do, um, well, I put them on Twitter anyway. These, I've just started this leadership with Miss Snuffy for your listeners who are teachers in education or parents, actually. Lots of advice for parents. Mm -hmm. I do this leadership with Miss Snuffy video where I, um, where I just let people, uh, where I give advice on various things and people write to me on Twitter and say, can you do a video on this? Can you do a video on that? I don't know how to teach them properly in schools. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Catherine. It's been really good to talk to you again. Thanks, Amy.